We're now uh, moving into uh, a territory that's uh, really uh, close to my heart. It will, I think, focus focusing a lot on a metabolic molecule called NAD. Our first speaker is uh, Joe Bauer. Are you there, Joe? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's great to see you, and thank you so much for joining the meeting. Uh, we really look forward to your talk. And uh, whenever you're ready, you can just uh, go ahead. All right. Well, I, I want to start uh, by thanking you, Morton, uh, as well as Alex and Daniela for putting together a fantastic meeting. Uh, really, really been enjoying this and really uh, missing it over the last couple of years. I didn't realize how much until uh, having this chance to see a lot of people again. Um, and of course, I appreciate the chance to tell you about some of the recent work going on. So, so Rikelt uh, Houtcooper gave a pretty nice introduction to NAD as a general topic uh, yesterday, and I'm going to largely agree with a lot of his introductory slides, so I'll go through this kind of quickly. Um, but I want to remind everyone that NAD has two major uh, types of functions in the cells. One as a co-substrate for enzymes like uh, PARPs and sirtuins on the left side of this diagram. Those enzymes consume NAD, and that necess necessitates a, a salvage pathway to resynthesize it. And so if you get an imbalance on the left side of this diagram, you can actually uh, change NAD levels uh, up or down, depending on that, that balance. Um, but often the, those, uh, those different pathways sometimes inappropriately, I think, uh, outshine in people's mind this fundamental role on the right side in energetics, where NAD is, a, is a, an electron carrier for things like beta oxidation and the, the Krebs cycle and glycolysis. And it's important to keep in mind there, there are hundreds of reactions that it's involved in nearly every aspect of metabolism. But, uh, but critically, there's no real sustainable way to produce ATP without NAD. And I think so for this reason, the right side of the diagram is really the reason why if you run out of NAD, uh, not even a single cell in culture can survive. Uh, it's really fundamental to life. And of course, the reason that it's come to our attention uh, in, in the context of this meeting is because NAD levels do decrease with age. And so it raises this question of, of which of these many processes it's involved in um, might be compromised in age and whether we can make things better uh, by, by restoring NAD levels. Uh, so it's not just age as well. I've put up some, some uh, example data here from our own lab where we see in, in some, not all tissues, but in many tissues, NAD levels do fall with age. Uh, it's been reproduced by many other labs or so shown um, uh, in, in other organisms and, and by many other groups at this point. Um, it's also been shown that NAD levels go up uh, in exercise and calorie restriction, so interventions that extend lifespan and uh, fall in many different disease processes as well. And so there's this pretty well-established general correlation between NAD levels uh, and health. And it's an attractive point for intervention uh, because it's, it's really a matter of giving a B vitamin, uh, vitamin B3, uh, different forms to boost NAD levels. So this is something that we can approach in a very simple and, and safe way to drive NAD levels back up. And so that's been tried in rodents, again, by us and many other groups at this point. And it's been largely successful across a, a wide range of, of different model systems. And so this is my summary slide uh, attempting to show uh, some of the themes and the benefits that have been reported for nicotinamide riboside or mononucleotide, which are two of these vitamin B3 isoforms uh, that have been used in supplementation studies. Uh, on the left side, you see a glucose homeostasis. So there's, there's potent anti-diabetic effects of these molecules in mice. And this is a glucose tolerance test where you can see the animal that has received an NAD booster. NMN in this case is able to clear glucose more quickly. Uh, in the middle uh, is a, a representative uh, figure from, from one of the heart failure studies that's been done. In this case, it's a genetic model uh, that has dilated cardiomyopathy and fractional shortening is what's shown in this graph. That's kind of a proxy for ejection fraction or for the contractility of the heart. And so if you look at the white bars, you can see this model has about a 50% reduction in the contractility of its heart. And if it's been supplemented with nicotinamide riboside to boost NAD levels, you, you recover um, half to two thirds of that function uh, back to its normal. And an, another major category that, that's gaining a lot of attention is, is cognitive models. So particularly Alzheimer's disease models in rodents. Uh, there's, there's been improvement across the board in the studies that have been done so far. And the, this is an example from the first paper where you're looking at a novel object exploration uh, paradigm and the control animals at this age are really unable to distinguish a novel object put into their cage. But if they've been supplemented with nicotinamide riboside, uh, they, they regain that ability to discriminate novel objects. And so this is this has really uh, been very encouraging and has, has led to 
many studies in humans, some of which are completed, many of which are ongoing. Uh, but as Raquel um, stated yesterday, uh, the human studies really haven't lived up to the promise of the rodent studies up to this point. Uh, there certainly have been some positive signals in human studies. There's many different outcomes that are under exploration in many trials in progress. Uh, but if we pick, for example, one of the things that really stands out in the rodents where you can effectively cure diabetes uh, in mice with these high dose NAD supplements, uh, when you try to translate this to humans, uh, it, it really has not worked out uh, in pre-diabetic or diabetic humans so far, or at least not to the same degree as, as the mice. And so the first study, this is actually a, a Danish study, Dalarup et al., um, that was the first one to really look at high dose um, NAD precursors in humans. And I'm looking at here in a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, a glucose infusion rate, which is essentially the, a, a simple way to think about this is just a measure of insulin sensitivity. And, and the only point I'm trying to make from this study is that they really were not able to distinguish um, the placebo treated from the, from the uh, NR treated group at the end of the study. And so there was really no measurable effect on insulin sensitivity at all in that case. On the right-hand side, I'm showing a more recent study done with the catenamide mononucleotide, uh, where again, it's, it's actually glucose disposal rate on this graph, but the same thing, it's essentially proportional to insulin sensitivity. And, and you can see in this case, um, statistically, they did see an improvement. Um, so it's, uh, again, not all negative in humans, but uh, again, this, this really contrasts with the mice where you see this just dramatic night and day effect. And then the humans, you may or may not uh, you know, see a marginal effect. And so this is something that I think the whole field's really struggling with right now is, you know, how, how much of what we're seeing in the rodents is going to be translated and, and what are the reasons uh, for these differences. And, and of course, there could be many, but uh, I'm personally a little bit hung up on, on this fact that if you scale by body weight, uh, we're still one to two orders of magnitude lower in humans. And we're really at, at the limit um, in, in terms of what you can dose humans. There, there's a risk of hepatotoxicity if we go much higher in terms of nicotinamide levels uh, and just the expense and the volume of these NAD precursors you would have to be eating to really match per body weight what the mice are taking um, really, really makes it not that feasible. Um, and so there are a couple of things I can say about, uh, about the future for human studies. Um, I think even though some of the same outcomes that we got from rodents might not hold up, there certainly are some positive signals in human trials. Uh, one of them um, that again was mentioned yesterday was this uh, trial of mitochondrial myopathy, where you know, doses that are clearly well tolerated in humans seem to be having a very dramatic effect in that disease. Uh, and so it's certainly worth continuing to look for conditions where, where our current dosing strategies are going to work in humans. Um, there's alternative strategies we can think about uh, to do things like inhibiting the NAD consuming enzymes. And I think we're, we're going to hear more about one of those, CD38, I think, in the, the next talk by Eric Verdon. Uh, but that, that's certainly a viable strategy and, and an alternative approach that does work well in rodents that, that might uh, you know, be more directly translatable in terms of the magnitude of the effect going into humans. We can think about strategies to improve delivery of precursors to target tissues. And so one thing my group has shown is that uh, intravenous delivery uh, can be much more effective than oral delivery in our hands. Uh, an alternative that was mentioned yesterday and then maybe in the same category is using the reduced forms of some of the precursors, which again seems to hit some of the target tissues much more effectively. Um, and so there may be ways to improve things that way. Um, but the, the other thing that I want to talk about for the rest of this uh, of, of my turn here is, is understanding the subcellular compartmentalization and usage of NAD. And so I think we, you know, to some degree in this field have had the illusion of gaining a lot of mechanistic knowledge uh, from having so many papers published, but the reality is that most of them have involved sort of flooding the system with NAD precursors and not really knowing you know, which tissue uh, and certainly not within the cell, you know, where the NAD is really having its effects. So I think that there's clear evidence that NAD is compartmentalized. That certainly affects which NAD dependent reactions are, are going to matter uh, where in the cell you're getting things. And so my group has been interested uh, in particular in the mitochondrial NAD pool, which is the easiest one, I think, to demonstrate that is distinct from the, from the bulk tissue or from the cytosolic NAD pool. Um, this is example data from my lab, and one of the, the types of findings that really got us fascinated with this topic, which is that under stress uh, in, in different tissues, we can really see evidence for the mitochondrial NAD pool being differentially regulated. Uh, so it had previously been shown that it can be preserved and survives longer than, than the cytosolic NAD pool when you deplete NAD. But we see cases like this, where this is a, a regenerating liver as an example. If you look on the left at whole liver NAD levels, they're down by about 50%. And in that same tissue, if you isolate the mitochondria and look at the mitochondrial NAD pool, it's actually going up. 
And so there seems to be a stress response um, that, that really involves shuttling some of the NAD into the mitochondria. And so, of course, to study this, it actually was not known how NAD gets into the mitochondria. And we really had to, to start from scratch thinking about how this could be occurring. Uh, at the time when we first started, there were, there were three pathways that had been proposed and all had evidence in support of them and, and defenders in the field. Uh, the first is on the left that, that there might be a complete NAD salvage pathway in the mitochondria. So they might basically take nicotinamide just like the cytosol does and, and make their own NAD pool completely independently. Uh, the middle option was that the mitochondria might import nicotinamide mononucleotide because it was clear that there is a uh, form of NMNAT, uh, NMNAT3, that's mitochondrial localized. And so it made it attractive to think you might import this intermediate NAD synthesis and, and then complete the synthesis with, within the organelle to generate the NAD pool. Uh, and the third option on the right is that mitochondria might just have a transporter and might import uh, sorry, uh, cytosolic NAD. Uh, directly into the mitochondria. And this is what was known to happen in yeast and plants, but people had looked pretty hard uh, by homology for such a transporter and, and really had failed to find it, which is why the, uh, the focus had shifted to the first two models. And so we got involved in a variety of studies using combinations of biochemistry and heavy isotope labeling studies, and we're really able to prove to our satisfaction that the third option here, direct import of NAD was happening. Uh, we can't exclude that the other two models are, are important under different circumstances or cell types, uh, but we clearly see this third option. Uh, and, and so despite the fact that by homology, it hadn't really been possible to pick out this transporter, we think it, it exists. And uh, that set off a, a bit of a race to, to discover what the actual identity was. And, and so, uh, I'll give you the spoiler right now that we think it's SLC25A51. Uh, we tried a variety of different candidate approaches to get here. Um, this one was particularly highlighted by going through a couple of studies of whole genome um, essential gene screens. And so this was really the only thing that popped out of a couple of different whole genome wide uh, screens where it was annotated as a mitochondrial uh, member of the solute carrier family and was essential across a variety of cell lines and just had no known function at all. In fact, there, there was zero hits on PubMed for this gene at the time when we started looking at it. And unlike a couple of the candidates we had examined uh, before that or everything we had examined up, up to that point, um, knocking out SLC25A51 really produced the phenotype we had been looking for, which is that whole cell NAD on the left is completely unaffected. Uh, but if you isolate mitochondria, you can see that the mitochondrial NAD pool on the right is depleted by about 85%. Um, so there's a really drastic reduction in, in mitochondrial NAD levels. Uh, at this point, we were fortunate to be able to pair up um, with uh, a couple of other labs that had developed mitochondrial NAD sensors, uh, Lulu Cambrone's lab at UT Austin and, and Kai Johnson at, at Max Planck. Uh, and so using these techniques, uh, we were able to show that even in the intact cells, you know, independent from isolating the mitochondria and introducing artifacts that way, potentially, uh, we're able to show that the free level of NAD floating around is actually decreased when you knock down SLC25A51 and increased when you overexpress it. Uh, and so, so the enzymes in the mitochondria really are seeing different free NAD levels available when you manipulate this pathway. Um, and we were able to uh, rescue this with the known NAD transporter from yeast, which I think argues that it really is the, the transporter component and not indirectly affecting some process that might be controlling mitochondrial NAD levels. So this graph is actually a little bit complicated. We've isolated mitochondria under different conditions and then incubated them with NAD to look for uptake. Uh, and so on the left side, you see the control condition where we isolate mitochondria that have a basal level of NAD, but if we incubate with NAD in blue, we can, we can raise the, uh, the amount of NAD present in the matrix. The second condition is uh, cells incubated with FK866. So the whole cell's been depleted of NAD. The mitochondria come out without any NAD, but if you incubate, with, with extrinsic uh, NAD, it still goes in because there's nothing wrong with the transporter in that system. Uh, and the third set of bars is the knockdown of SLC25A51. So those mitochondria also come out with low NAD, but now they're not able to take it up when you add it exogenously. And finally, at the end, we've rescued those knockdown cells over expressing this yeast mitochondrial NAD transporter, NDT1. And now you can see that that activity comes back. We can do the opposite uh, if we take yeast that are knocked out for both of the known mitochondrial NAD transporters in that organism. Um, 
we can rescue with the human SLC 25A51. So the, this is uh, yeast mitochondria that have been isolated and incubated with radioactive NAD. You can see the uptake in mild type mitochondria in the black line here. If we take those knockout yeast that lack mitochondrial NAD transport, that's the gray line where there's some background, but it really uh, doesn't take up any NAD over time. And we've put back in the human uh, transporter here in the red, and you can see if anything, it's actually taking up NAD faster than, than wild type yeast mitochondria. And so the major function um, that we see when you knock out this transporter, the major loss of function that we see is, is mitochondrial respiration, as you might expect. Um, NAD is essential to the Krebs cycle and is the, the donor for electrons to complex one. Um, but we were actually still shocked at you know, the degree to which the, there was really a complete loss of respiration. So this is data from a seahorse flux analyzer. These lines are oxygen consumption over time. If you look at the black line from regular wild type mitochondria, um, you can see or the cells that haven't been manipulated. You can see the basal respiration rate uh, in the first uh, segment, we've added oligomycin to inhibit ATP synthesis. So that decreases respiration as expected. If you add FCCP that uncouples and you look at maximal respiration and then wrote known antimycin A poison the mitochondria. So you can see what's, uh, what's left is non-mitochondrial respiration. And then if you look at the knockout cells in red, you can see that they just look dead. Um, we were we've never seen cells respire uh, that lowly. And uh, in fact, assumed they were uh, potentially killed by something when we first saw these results, uh, but we can, we can recover those cells. Um, they continue to proliferate based on glycolysis. We can actually take those cells and reinfect with SLC 25A51 and, and recover uh, normal function in the mitochondria. And in fact, the mitochondria stayed very normal, except for the, uh, the loss of NAD. If we do metabolomics on them, most of the other metabolites are actually uh, relatively at normal levels. Uh, and most of the proteins are close to normal levels. And, and as you can see here, it, it, they do uh, immediately start functioning again when you add back SLC 25A51. And so at this point, I hope I've convinced you that, that, that this protein, um, this uh, previously orphan uh, cellulose carrier in the mitochondria really is a mammalian mitochondrial NAD transporter and seems to be the critical one for at least a lot of the cell types that we've looked at. And of course, what my lab is interested in going forward is, is understanding the regulatory mechanisms. We do think that this pathway is stimulated under certain stressful conditions. And so we're looking uh, at, at binding partners, post-translational modifications that might regulate it. Uh, and of course, we're really interested in understanding what its, its roles are in normal physiology and disease. So this is all early days, uh, you know, for progressing beyond um, what I've already shown you, but I'll give you a, a couple of hints of things that we're starting to look at in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, one thing we did early on was get access to a uh, large collection of heart failure biopsies maintained by Ken Margulies uh, at Penn. So these are human uh, patients looking at non-failing versus failing hearts. And we can see SLC 25A51 is actually downregulated in the failing biopsies. And well, we actually re reproduced the finding that NAMPT, nicotinamide phosphoribosyl transferase, is also down in these heart samples, which, which was already known. Nothing else involved in NAD synthesis uh, is downregulated as far as we can see. So this, this did really stand out among the whole set of genes related to NAD metabolism. And we're particularly interested in this pathway in the heart uh, because we think it might be playing a role in resilience when, when you deplete uh, NAD in hearts. We had previously generated a heart-specific NAMPT knockout. So this is just disrupting NAD synthesis, the major pathway that's responsible for NAD synthesis and cardiomyocytes. Uh, and if you look here on the, on the top right, you can see in the first two um, sets of bars, there's about a 70% depletion of NAD in the heart by two weeks. And by eight weeks, these animals were still walking around with about 85% less NAD in their hearts. Uh, which again was was really a surprise to us. We thought that they'd be dead long before that, but um, they not only survived, but they they really um, were hard to pick out from the uh, from the controls by eight weeks, even though they did did go on to die a few weeks later, um, very suddenly, uh, which think we think is when the NAD really just bottomed out to zero, uh, but. I think that the reason that they were actually able to tolerate this so well uh, is probably related to this observation on the right side of the graph, which is that if you isolate mitochondria from these tissues, just like in the liver when I showed you before, um, they really do seem to uh, preferentially retain the NAD that remains. And so the depletion of NAD in mitochondria is actually much slower and, and more muted compared to the de depletion of NAD in the whole tissue. And in fact, these animals uh, out at eight weeks where total tissue NAD is down 85%. Um, if you isolate mitochondria, they still have normal respiration. And in fact, 
uh, in three experiments in a row now, it's, it's been statistically significantly higher respiration from the knockouts with lower NAD levels, um, which we still don't understand. And I'd love to hear from anyone that has an idea why that might be, but we presume there's some, some adaptations over time uh, that, that make the electron transport chain a little bit more efficient in these animals. Uh, and, and most impressively, I think if we throw these animals on a treadmill at eight weeks of age with that low NAD level in the heart, they're still able to run uh, just as far as their wild type litter mates. Uh, and and so, so whatever's going on in terms of adaptation as the NAD levels are falling in these animals, it, it's fairly effective. And so this is why we think that if the NAD depletion that's seen in actual failing hearts is really related mechanistically, um, it, it may have something to do with this pathway uh, not functioning properly and with that downregulation of SLC 25A51 that we're seeing in heart failure. And so the last thing I'll mention is just that it, from even from publicly available databases, uh, we can see that there's an association of SLC 25A51 expression with cancer. Uh, so in particular in liver cancer and thyroid cancer, uh, it seems like it's a, an unfavorable prognostic marker. You're more likely to die if it's upregulated. In kidney cancer, it's the opposite. Uh, and, and this actually might make sense because many kidney cancers uh, have adaptations that force them to uh, rely on glycolytic metabolism. And, and so pushing the NAD back into the mitochondria might actually be maladaptive for the kidney cancer. And, and, it, and that might be the reason why it's actually a good thing to have this pathway upregulated. But in the other two cases, uh, you see tumor types that, that you might want to target by inhibiting SLC25A51. And so we have actually partnered with a, a company called Cyclica that's based in Canada uh, that does artificial intelligence based uh, drug screening. And so we actually uh, hooked up with these guys at, at a previous iteration of this meeting. Uh, so I want to thank the organizers again for, for keeping this going over the years. This has been really valuable for my lab and, uh, and we've got a lot of interesting collaborations going on now uh, with this with this company. Um, the image here of the protein going into a black box is my way of uh, summarizing my understanding of how we're getting these molecules that Cyclic is coming up with. Uh, it's really a little beyond my mathematical understanding, um, but what I wanted to just highlight here for the, the last uh, bit of data I'll show you is, is that it does seem to be working at this point, uh, at least in a preliminary sense. Some of the molecules they've been giving us um, do prevent uh, uptake of NAD into mitochondria. And so here the purple one is, uh, the purple bar is wild type mitochondria, where we've actually depleted NAD to get the signal um, down and then supplemented with NR to boost NAD levels back up. And then we're, we're measuring NAD going back into the mitochondria here. And so the purple bar is the, the wild type normal level and three different compounds uh, predicted by Cyclica to inhibit SLC25A51 are all decreasing uh, the rate of NAD uptake back into mitochondria. So we're optimistic that this pathway will be, uh, will be druggable in the near future and that we can really um, see how important a role it's playing in, in uh, physiology and in diseases like cancer. And so with that, I will just stop and, and thank the lab and our funding sources. And I just wanna highlight a couple of people quickly uh, who have really led this work in the lab, uh, Tim Luongo in particular as a, as a postdoc um, who has uh, just moved on to a biotech company, but, but really led a lot of the studies that I showed you. Caroline Perry has taken over. Uh, a lot of, of, of these projects now. And I want to highlight uh, Lulu Cambron's lab at UT Austin that we're really uh, partners through this whole process of characterizing SLC 25A51. And I'm um, happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Joe. Really great uh, talk. And I really appreciate that, that you got something out of this uh, meeting also at the industry <laughs> academia combination. This is really one of the reasons why we do this. Um, there are some questions on Slack with time for one, I think, from Ruben zapata Perez. Do you think that direct NAD import excludes transport of NAD precursors into the mitochondria? Uh, no, I, I, I definitely think there's room for both pathways to exist. I will say in, in some of the cultured cell lines where we can do this in a controlled system, um, we see extremely low NAD levels when we block just the transport. So I, I think some cells are, are certainly uh, dominantly reliant on the pathway that we're talking about, but uh, absolutely the, there's room for the other pathways to exist uh, in other cell types or other stress conditions. All right, thank you very much, Joe. There are many more questions on Slack, so it would be great if you can log on and, uh, and answer some of them. Let's give uh, Joe another round of applause.